constructs as a creature type have some of the greatest variety of any class of monster in Pathfinder. And yet, they tend to be typecast as magic robots. Now, that absolutely is a type of construct, but with constructs, it's literally, if you can dream it, you can build it. In this first part of my Guide to Constructs in Pathfinder 1E, I'll be looking at this crafted creature category from the DM's perspective, and going over a few notable subtypes and loot. Then, in part two, I'll break down building your own constructs and some of the options players have. Now, without further ado, let's talk about constructs as a creature type in the broad terms. Constructs have d10 hit die. They have a base attack bonus equal to their number of hit die. Constructs have no constitution score, any effect that requires a con save. The construct gets a flat plus 10 bonus to the roll. No bonuses and no penalties. Constructs get bonus hit points according to their size. Small constructs get 10 bonus hit points, medium 20, large 30, huge 40, gargantuan 60, and colossal 80. Constructs do not heal damage on their own, but they can be repaired by exposure to certain effects, or through the use of the craft construct feat or the make whole spell. Constructs have a lot of immunities, such as all mind effects, charm, compulsion, morale effects, patterns, and phantoms. Constructs are also immune to disease, death effects, necromancy effects, paralysis, poison, sleep, stun, ability damage, ability drain, fatigue, exhaustion, and non-lethal damage. Constructs receive two skill points plus their intelligence modifier per hit die. Unless, of course, as is often the case with constructs, the construct is mindless, in which case it receives zero skill points. Now that you understand the overall traits that constructs share, let's talk about the most iconic construct type, the golem. Golems are basically a solid block of matter animated by a spirit. This is typically an earth elemental, but not always. Said spirit is placed into the specially constructed body and bound to the will of a sorcerer, magi, or other caster. The first golem I'm going to look at is the clay golem. Clay golems have two slam attacks that deal 2d10 plus 7 points of damage. Clay golems have an AC of 24 and DR10 that's bypassed by adamant or bludgeoning damage. Clay golems are immune to magic. Well, any spell that allows spell resistance. However, they are affected by certain spells differently. If a clay golem has the spell Move Earth cast on it, it is driven back 120 feet and it deals 3d12 damage. Disintegrate deals 1d12 damage and the clay golem is slowed for 1d6 rounds. Earthquake deals 5d10, and the clay golem can't move for one round. Any effect that deals acid damage heals the clay golem for one point for every three points of acid damage it would deal. Clay golems also have the Berserk trait. There is a 1% chance that increases every round by an additional 1% cumulative that the spirit animating the clay golem will break free and drive the golem into a murderous frenzy, attacking the nearest opponent, creature, or even unattended object. This percent returns to zero if the clay golem is out of combat for one minute. Clay golems inflict cursed wounds. What that means is that any wounds inflicted by the clay golem resist magical healing and a DC 26 caster level check must be made to heal the target. Finally, clay golems have haste. After being in combat for one round, a clay golem can cast haste on itself as a free action. This effect lasts for three rounds. Next up, stone golems. 
They have two slam attacks that deal 2d10 plus 9 damage. Stone golems have dr10, bypassed by adamant. They are also immune to magic. Any spell that allows spell resistance, the golem is immune to. However, some spells affect stone golems differently. Transmute Rock to Mud slows the golem for 2d6 rounds. Casting Mud to Rock heals all the stone golem's HP. Stone to Flesh negates the stone golem's DR and immunities for one round. Finally, stone golems have Slow. As a free action every two rounds, stone golems can cast Slow in a 10-foot radius burst. Any affected creature is slowed for 7 rounds. DC 17 will save negates this effect. Now let's talk about Iron Golems. An Iron Golem has two slam attacks that do 2d10 plus 16 damage with a 19 to 20 crit range. If the Iron Golem threatens a crit, its slam attacks deal additional damage equal to half its strength modifier. Basically, it hits as if it was hitting with a two-handed weapon. Iron Golems have DR15 bypassed by Adamant. Iron Golems are immune to magic in the same way that Clay and Stone Golems are, and they're affected by a small number of spells differently. Any spell that does electric damage slows the Iron Golem for three rounds. An attack that deals fire damage breaks any slow effect, and heals the golem for one point of damage for every three points of fire damage it would take. Also, iron golems are affected by any rust effect normally. Iron golems have a breath weapon. As a free action, every 1d4 plus 1 rounds, the iron golem can release a cloud of poison gas that fills up a 10-foot cube. This gas deals 1d4 constitution damage for 4 rounds. Fortitude save, DC 19. Now that I've talked to you about some of the classical golem types, let's talk about some of the more unique or strange golem types. Such as the alchemical golem. The slam attacks of an alchemical golem have random effects, like sickened, fatigue, or bonus elemental damage applied to their target. Also, an alchemical golem can throw bombs, just like an alchemist, dealing 8d6 energy damage of a random type. There's also dragonhide golems. A dragonhide golem has a breath weapon that deals 20d6 of energy damage depending on the type of dragon used to create the construct. Dragonhide golems can also have dragon graphs. <laughs> Such as elemental auras. This deals 2d6 energy damage to creatures within 10 feet. You could graft on wings. This gives them a fly speed of 100 feet with clumsy maneuverability. They can have a grafted head. This adds an additional breath weapon type. Although it does not increase the number of times, the Dragonhide Golem can use its breath weapon. Also, you could graft on a powerful tail. This gives it a secondary natural attack. But if flesh isn't your thing, you could always have bone, like the Fossil Golem. The attacks of a Fossil Golem have an effect called petrification. What that means is its slam attacks deal 1d6 points of Dexterity Drain. If its victim's Dexterity modifier hits 0, that victim is petrified as if by the Flesh to Stone spell. Finally, there's the Viridium, that's Magic Uranium, Golem. All the attacks of a Viridium Golem have Disease. If you're hit by one of its attacks, you have to make a DC 24 fort save, or contract Viridium Leprosy, which causes 1d6 points of Charisma and Constitution damage, one time per day until it's cured. Now, 
let's move on from those lumbering blocks of solid matter to something a little more elegant. Something more whimsical, something more creative, something very steampunk. I'm talking clockwork constructs. This is where you get your magical robots. Clockwork constructs must be wound in order to function. Also, clockwork constructs can be unwound with their key. Everyone has a unique key. Or this could also be done with a disabled device check of 20 plus the clockwork constructs CR. This must be done to a willing or helpless construct. Some of the exciting clockwork constructs out there to encounter are things like the clockwork spy. This is a tiny construct with a fly speed of 15 feet and a stealth score of plus 11. Clockwork spies have an ability called record audio. As a swift action, a clockwork spy can record any audio within a 20-foot radius for one hour per hit die it has. The recording is made onto a small gemstone worth at least 50 gold in the clockwork spy's body. Clockwork spies also have self-destruct. Basically, the clockwork spy explodes one round after it dies, destroying any recording inside of it. A DC-20 disabled device check stops the spy from exploding. Finally, clockwork spies are vulnerable to electricity. Next up, we have the clockwork soldier. Clockwork soldiers are proficient with all simple and martial weapons. Now, remember, they have a base attack bonus equal to their HD. The version available on the PFSRD has 8 hit die and a strength score of 28. That's a plus 9 strength modifier. So, before any enhancement bonuses applied to its weapons, it has a plus 17 to hit. Clockwork Soldiers have DR5 bypassed by Adamant. Also, Clockwork Soldiers have a trait called Efficient Winding. This means they stay active for two days per hit die every time they're wound. These constructs also have a trait called Latch. A Clockwork Soldier can attempt to disarm an opponent or grapple an opponent as a standard action without provoking attacks of opportunity. It also gets a bonus to disarm attempts and a plus two bonus to its combat maneuver defense against being disarmed. Clockwork soldiers can enter a state called standby. A clockwork soldier can enter standby as a standard action. In this state, it takes a minus four to perception checks, but it can exit standby as a swift action. If it does this to attack, it gets a plus four bonus on its initiative roll. Now you might wonder why exactly do they enter standby? Because time spent in standby doesn't count against its wind time. This allows clockwork soldiers to remain on guard almost indefinitely. So it's no surprise to encounter them in ancient ruins, long forgotten tombs, or other places where they can immediately jump to life and attack unwise adventurers. Finally, clockwork soldiers are vulnerable to electricity. The final clockwork construct I'm going to spotlight is the clockwork dragon. If you want to see a picture of one, just look up awesome in the dictionary. Clockwork dragons have a lot of attacks. They have a bite that deals 4d6 plus 12 damage. Two claws that deal 2d8 plus 12 damage. A tail slap that deals 2d6 plus 6 damage, two wing buffets that deal 2d6 plus 6 damage, and of course, a breath weapon that creates a 100-foot line dealing 14d6 of fire damage. A clockwork dragon has dr15 bypassed by adamant and vulnerability to electricity. Clockwork dragons have a trait called adamant weapons. Its bite and claw attacks are treated as adamant for the purpose of bypassing DR. Clockwork dragons have efficient winding. Clockwork dragons remain functional for three days per HD after winding. Clockwork dragons also self-destruct. If a clockwork dragon dips below 10% of its total HP, 
It explodes on the next round, dealing 10d6 slashing and 10d6 fire damage to any creature around it. Finally, there are a few variant traits that Clockwork Dragons can have, such as Acid Breath. This replaces its Fire Breath with a 60-foot line that deals 10d8 acid damage. Clockwork Dragons can also be made of Mithril. This replaces their Adamant Weapon trait and damage reduction for a 70-foot swim speed and a fly speed of 200 feet. It also gets the ability to, one time per day, gain the benefits of haste for 1d4 rounds. Finally, Clockwork Dragons can have a trait called Destroyer. This replaces its breath weapon with a heavy bombard siege weapon that deals 9 d6 points of damage and has 10 shots. Now, let's move on to the Animated Object class of Constructs. When it comes to animated objects, every coffee cup, every garden tool, every weapon, just about everything in even an ordinary place can all of a sudden jump to life and attempt to murder you. Animated objects are brought to life with the Animate Objects spell or the Craft Construct feat. Animated objects get hit dice based on their size. A small animated object has 2d10 hit die plus 10 bonus hit points. A large animated object has 4 d10 hit die plus 30 additional HP. Animated objects also have construction points. The number of construction points any animated object has is determined by its size. A medium-sized animated object will have 2 CP. A gargantuan animated object will have 5 CP. Construction points can be used to purchase abilities. Some examples are additional attack. This costs 1 CP. Additional movement. This also costs 1 CP. Just in case you want a flying wagon or a swimming catapult. There's also improved attack. All the animated objects melee or ranged attacks deal damage as if it was one size category larger. This also costs 1 CP. Now, for additional CP, animated objects can have construct flaws. These are drawbacks, such as brittle, the object gains vulnerability to cold, flammable, the object gains vulnerability to fire, or, my personal favorite, haunted, the object takes damage from positive energy as if it was undead, and it can be detected via the Detect Undead spell. Some example animated objects are Animated Jack-O-Lantern. This is a small animated object. It has Hardness 5. Hardness is basically DR for animated objects. And, as you might guess, the Jack-O-Lantern is vulnerable to cold. The construction points used to create it are Additional Natural Attack. It has a bite. And Burn. This adds fire damage to its bite. Even though it's small, it got an additional construction point from its construct flaw. Another animated object is the terrifying-sounding Hobbling Hook Clawed Apparatus. This is a large animated object with Hardness 10. It has two slam attacks that deal 1d8 plus 6 damage. The Hobbling Hook Clawed Apparatus has three construction points from its size. It spent one for an additional attack and two for metal, which makes it made out of metal. Finally... Let's talk about the Brass Juggernaut. This is a big brass statue that jumps to life and tries to kill you. It is a huge animated object. It has Hardness 10. It has two slam attacks that deal 2d6 plus 15 damage and a trample attack that deals 2d6 plus 15 damage and has a DC 23 to not be trampled. The Brass Juggernaut has four construction points from its size, two spent on being metal, and two spent on trample. All right, now let's talk about some animated objects that don't easily fit into any particular category. First up, the Tupelac. This is essentially a small, scrimshawed, ivory idol that is essentially a magical hitman. 
All you have to do is find a target and sick a Tupalak on the poor unlucky soul. Tupalaks are small constructs. They have a bite attack dealing 1d8 plus 10 damage. They also have two claw attacks that deal 1d4 plus 5 damage. A Tupalak has dr10 bypassed by bludgeoning. They also have a trait called Scrimshaw Magic. At creation, a spell can be inscribed onto the Tupalak. With Scrimshaw, the Tupalak gains the ability to use this spell three times per day as a spell-like ability at caster level 7th. The Tupalak has an ability called Seek Target. Place a drop of blood, some hair, or similar thing into the creature's mouth, and it will attempt to seek out and destroy that target. The Tupalak knows the direction of the target and gets a plus 20 insight bonus on perception checks to find the target. Finally, Tupalaks have Shearing Jaws. The Tupalak adds twice its strength bonus to its bite attacks, and it's treated as if it was large category for attempts to move a creature it has grappled with its bite. Now let's move on to a construct type that's either dangerously whimsical or whimsically dangerous. Trumploy. This is actually not an individual creature or even family of creatures, but a template that you can apply to any NPC or monster. Essentially, a Trumploy is a painting that's been activated through magical or occult practices to come to life. After a Trumploy steps out of its painting, it is essentially a very accurate and realistic-looking replica made out of paint. Any Trumploy gets an enhancement bonus to its armor and a shield bonus based on its hit dice. If it has 5 to 8 hit dice, it gets a plus 1 armor bonus. If it has 9 to 12, it gets a plus 2 armor bonus and a plus 1 shield bonus. 13 to 16 plus three armor bonus, plus one shield bonus. 17 plus, plus four armor bonus, plus two shield bonus. Trumploy also get bonus hit points like any construct. Small get plus 10 hit points, medium plus 20, large plus 30, etc. Trumploy also get regeneration. If the Trumploy is destroyed, it reappears on its original canvas after 2d4 days. The only way to destroy a Trumploy permanently is to destroy its canvas. Trumploy also get an enhancement bonus to their natural attacks or the weapons that they're depicted wielding. This is also based on their hit die. 6 to 4, plus 1 bonus. 7 to 9, plus 2. 10 to 12, plus 3. 13 to 15, plus 4. And 16 plus, plus 5. Trumploy also have Autotelic. This means they use their Charisma score instead of their Constitution score when determining things like bonus HP from hit die, fort saves, and any other con-related effect. Finally, Trumploy can enter paintings. They can enter any painting they touch. It can enter any painting it touches as a standard action and exit as a move action. When inside the painting, the Trumploy gains the Freeze monster ability to appear as part of the painting. Basically, it can take a 20 on stealth checks to appear to be an inanimate aspect of the painting, and they can hide in plain sight. The final type of construct I'd like to talk about is another classic, the Homunculus. This is a tiny construct, and its only defensive abilities are the ones that all constructs have. Homunculi have a fly speed of 50 feet and a plus 12 bonus to their stealth rolls. Homunculi have poison as part of their bite attack. DC 13, and if the target fails, it falls asleep for one minute. The poison effect lasts for 60 minutes with a new save every minute until the poison is cured after one save. Homunculi have a telepathic link. The homunculi can convey everything it sees and hears to its master as long as the master is within 1,500 feet. There are also a bunch of aftermarket improvements you can slap onto a homunculus. All it costs is golden time. Some of these upgrades are 
Acid Breath. This gives the homunculi a 15-foot line of acid damage, dealing 1d6 points of damage for every two hit die the homunculi possesses. You could also give a homunculi extra eyes. This gives it all-round vision. A homunculi can have a spell-like ability, the only restriction being that it has to be a spell that can be made into a potion. A homunculi can also spit its poison. This upgrade allows the homunculi to deliver its poison as a ranged touch attack instead of a bite. Of course, homunculi can have toughened hide. This increases its natural armor bonus by one, two, or three. A homunculi can be given the voice upgrade. This allows the homunculi to speak. Now, let's move on to Constructs and Treasure. This comes from Ultimate Equipment, Appendix 1. Homunculi can have E-type Treasure, this is Armor and Weapons, or F-type Treasure, Combat Gear. Now, this is just for the Construct itself. They also might be Guarding Treasure, such as Type B, Coins and Gems, or Type C, Art Objects, or maybe even Type H, Lair Treasure. This is basically a bundle of different valuables, such as magic items, coins, and other things of worth. Now, I'd like to end the video with some inspiration for your constructs. Obviously, perhaps the most iconic construct of all, the Golem of Prague. This is an old folktale about a rabbi who creates a golem. In a similar vein is the classic of gothic horror, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, about an ambitious and possibly insane doctor who decides to play God and bring something to life. There are also many construct-like creatures in the grimdark future of Warhammer 40k. Things like Cyber Cherubs, the iconic Servitors, Cyber Mastiffs, which are robotically enhanced dogs, the various Wraith constructs like Wraithguard and Wraith Knights of the Eldar, the many robotic innovations of the Tau, such as Crisis Suits, the devastating Imperial Knights, or the diabolic Daemon Engines. You might also consider looking at the Soulkin of Final Fantasy XIV. They have golems naturally, but there are also many more unique ones, such as the Head and Two Hands Phobad. The very unique looking Magasu. This is basically a mud golem, but it's just the head. Then there's the Marble Urlith. This creature is very similar to the iconic Final Fantasy boss, the Demon Wall. Or there's the Evil Weapon. This is basically just an animated sword, but it's got a weird furry rat thing to go along with it. Basically the spirit that is wielding the sword. Another great source of inspiration from the world of tabletop is Vampire the Masquerade, particularly the Gargoyles. These are creatures of stone created by my favorite faction, House Tremere. They were used as shock troops and guardians until they turned on their vampire sorcerer masters. Now, if you're in the mood to spend a little time doom-scrolling YouTube, you could check out the Russian homunculus videos. I would highly recommend this for fans of lo-fi and analog horror. It'll give you all kinds of inspiration for meth lab grown little men. Finally, the game Warframe has all kinds of construct-like things left behind by the Orican Empire. Obviously, the Warframes themselves have the whole robot ninja thing going in spades. But there's also their sentinel companions, small familiar-like robots that are either constructed or grown. Finally, the Corpus faction has all kinds of animal-like robots to unleash on their enemies. Thank you very much for watching the D6 Damage Guide to Constructs in Pathfinder 1E. Now, if you're in the market for sourcebooks, dice, and much, much more for Pathfinder and D&D, check out Noble Knight Games by following the affiliate link in the description. And if you're in the mood for a haunted house adventure, check out Sorceress the Dietrich House, available right now on DriveThruRPG. Finally, if you'd like to take your game further, join the D6 Damage Discord. We have fantastic discussions about all aspects of Pathfinder, character builds, game mastering, and much, much more. The link is in the description.